Well, hello and good morning to you and welcome to Hailsham Parish Church. Welcome to our YouTube channel for this morning's service on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent, which of course means that it is nearly Christmas. Just to let you know that this evening at six o'clock and then at eight o'clock, our Carols by Candlelight service will be live streamed via our website. And then later, an edited version will be available on YouTube. And then on Christmas Eve, from 11 o'clock in the morning, there'll be a special uh, Christmas reflection of carols and readings, and that will be on our YouTube channel. After that, you'll have to wait, I'm afraid, until Sunday the 3rd of January for our next YouTube service. Uh, The tech team do need a break over Christmas. Now, we've called our service this morning a Christmas feast. And for the live service, it would, of course, include us sharing the Lord's Supper as part of our Christmas celebration. But for now, do download our service sheet if you can. Do get hold of a Bible. And in a moment, we're ready to begin. And so we begin our service this morning with these familiar words of affirmation, of faith in our great God and Saviour. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And so we light our four candles for this, the fourth Sunday of Advent. And as the candles are alight, so we join in the Advent prayer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, eternal creator of light and darkness. In this season of Advent, when the sun's light is swallowed up by the growing darkness of the night, you renew your promise to reveal among us the splendor of your glory, made flesh and visible to us in Jesus Christ, your Son. Through the prophets, you teach us to hope for his reign of peace. Through the outpouring of his Spirit, you open our blindness to the glory of his presence. Strengthen us in our weakness, Support us in our stumbling efforts to do your will and free our tongues to sing your praise. For to you all honour and blessing are due, now and forever. Amen. And so we sing our opening carol. It came upon a midnight clear, that glorious song of old. Do pause, do turn to the link and listen in. That carol spoke of the angel's message, peace on earth, goodwill to all men, from heaven's all-gracious King. And so we come to that time of confession, recognizing our need, our need of a great Saviour the one who is able to bring us peace with God. Forgiveness, pardon, and new life. But first we hear these words of our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Indeed, we recognize that's our only response in the light of God's word to us. Lord, have mercy for how far we fall short, how much we have strayed, how lost we are in sin and shame. But here then the words of comfort our Savior Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear what the Apostle Paul says. This is a true saying and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the Apostle John tells us, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So then, let us, with that great invitation, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And so we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And the great good news, almighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a special prayer for today, this the fourth Sunday of Advent. Heavenly Father, who chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of the promised Saviour, Fill us, your servants, with your grace, that in all things we may embrace your holy will and rejoice with her in your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, you may like to pause and click on the link to our next song, which is uh, a soloist uh, with something called The Wondrous Gift, which is a different take on the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Do listen and enjoy. Those amazing words, O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. We're going to turn together to the Word of God now and uh, our Bible reading from Hosea and from Matthew 2 will be read by Joan. That'll be followed by Rory who will uh, be explaining God's Word to us, preaching to us, and then David Griffin is going to lead us 
in our prayers. Today's reading is from Hosea chapter 11 um, and also from Matthew chapter 2. So Hosea 11, 1 to 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with calls of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. Then from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. <clears throat> when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Joan, thank you very much. Do please keep your Bible open at Hosea chapter 11, or you might like to turn to page nine, pages nine and 10 in the order of service, where you'll see um, the Bible reading and where I hope the sermon is going to go. Before I begin, let me pray for us. Gracious Lord, please would you speak to us now as we come to your word. Fill us with the joy of knowing you. Give us, I pray, soft hearts that we may both hear what you have to say to us and respond in faith. For Jesus' great glory we pray. Amen. I don't know if you're familiar with the song, Driving Home for Christmas. It's a bit of a Christmas classic, uh, and even if you don't think you know it, you may well recognize it. It's been in the background of quite a number of Christmas adverts. It goes like this. I'm not going to sing, you'll be pleased to know, but these are the words. I'm driving home for Christmas. Oh, I can't wait to see those faces. I'm driving home for Christmas. Well, I'm moving down that line, and it's been so long, but I will be there. I sing this song to pass the time away, driving in my, in my car, driving home for Christmas. It's going to take some time, but I'll get there, top to toe in tailbacks. Oh, I've got red lights all around, but soon there'll be a freeway. Get my feet on holy ground. The holy ground, which is being spoken about in the song I learned this week, is Middlesbrough. Chris Rea wrote this popular Christmas song on his way home to the borough. Now, whether you consider Teesside to be holy ground or not is not important. What is, is being home. 
We long to be home at Christmas time, to be in a place where we are known and loved, the place where we feel safe, surrounded by people who we care about. Just look at the adverts on television. It doesn't really matter what they're trying to sell to you. The way in which they sell it to you is by setting it in a loving, secure, happy home, beautifully decorated and surrounded by generations of smiling people. This year, of course, that longing, the longing to be home, is made all the more difficult by the restrictions, by the fact that many of us won't be able to enjoy the Christmas that we'd love to with the people that we care about. The story of most of the Bible is the story of life away from home and of God calling his people back home. It's the story of the pain of living in a world that is not our home. Let's read together verses 1 to 4 of Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize that it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. God is our Father and he loves us. He yearns for us with the affection of a besotted dad. He loves his people passionately. And verse 1 reminds us that the Lord moved heaven and earth during the exodus for his son. During the, the, the calling them out of Israel. He rescued them from a genocidal dictator. He saved them from the army of a superpower. He parted the Red Sea, he provided, he cared for them on their journey. And he offered them a home of richness and peace. And how they responded in verse 2, well, glance down with me. But the more I called Israel, the farther they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, they burned incense to images. They responded by running away. And here is the awful reality of sin. It is shockingly personal. Imagine that bit in a wedding where the groom has just got up to give his speech and before he says lovely things about his beautiful new wife, he begins to address his mum and dad. And he says, I want to thank the people who've raised me, who've cared for me, who've given me everything, who've consistently loved me and supported me. And on cue, the best man comes in holding an enormous bunch of flowers and a, a bottle of something lovely and walks straight past the groom's parents and gives it to another couple sitting there enjoying the meal. A couple who have had nothing to do with raising the groom. Can you imagine that? It would be shocking, wouldn't it? It would be awful. It would be so embarrassing. Well, that's what we're like. God comes to us healing, providing, teaching, rescuing, loving. And we turn away from him. We give glory to ourselves. We credit others. And this is awful. We should feel this desperately. Feel this, this wrong to the core of our being. Sin 
is a personal insult to a loving father, and we're all guilty of it. Do you see now why we are far from home? Not because we've been kicked out, but because we've run away. Run away laughing at flicking the Vs to God as we go. What fools we are. You'll see the the second thing I've put on our sheets is how God feels about this situation. I don't think we'll be surprised by how he feels, at least not until we get to verse 8. But read with me verses 5 to 7. This is God speaking. Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. How does God feel? Well, he's angry. He is angry with his child. And this is the anger of a deeply wounded father. He speaks of judgment coming on Israel, on on Ephraim, those words used interchangeably. He speaks of exile, enslavement, and destruction. That's how God feels about sin. He hates it. This is how God feels about my sin, about your sin, about my greed, about your unkindness, about my gossip, about your lust, about my anger and your lies. This is how God feels about our indifference towards him. Most of us can't even be bothered to angrily reject his claims in our lives. We'd rather just ignore him. Thomas Goodwin, a Christian from a long time ago, said this. If God's wrath against sin was a fire, then all the earthly bellows would not be able to make the furnace hot enough. God hates sin. He hates it with a passion that should terrify us. We should tremble. We should see that we are no better than Israel. We should see that this exile, this enslavement, this destruction is what each of us deserves. You'd have thought that this would have terrified God's people. But, um, well, have a look at verse 7 and see how they respond. My people are determined to turn from me. God's people are bent on turning away from him. Turning away from his promises. And so, judgment comes. But wonderfully, this is not all that God feels. Look at the surprise of verses 8 and 9. God speaking again, How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. This is how God feels about his son. He loves him. He loves them with the compassion of a wounded father. Admar and Zeboim 
were two cities, two towns that were destroyed when God's judgment fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 29. And the Lord says, I can't treat my son like that. Israel might deserve that, but that's not how I'll treat him. There is hope for the people of God. Why? Because of the Lord's compassion. Because he loves his people. Because he wants us to be home with him, not cast into some outer darkness. This quotation by an American pastor is such good news. Commenting on these verses, he writes, The sins of those who belong to God open the floodgates of his heart of compassion for us. It is not our loveliness that wins his heart. It is our unloveliness. Isn't that good news? How do you feel today? Do you feel lovely or do you feel unlovely? Verses 1 to 7 are, are like a mirror. As I read those verses, I, I see myself and I feel wretched. I think that's not pretty. I deserve to be far from home. I deserve nothing but my father's right anger. But we don't get what we deserve. God's heart is melted by our unloveliness. What glory. The last bits of these verses leave us with a real conundrum, I think. Let's read verses 10 and 11. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. God will call his children home. In his judgment, he will roar, and his children will come trembling home from their exile in Egypt and, and Assyria, from their scattering, they will be gathered to the Lord. Right at the end of, of verse 11, I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. God's love won't be thwarted by our sin. God's loving plan for his people isn't derailed by our running away, by our failure. God's people will be in God's place, enjoying his love. But how? How is it that we will be brought safely home? How can God square what appears to be this circle? There's a tension, I think, isn't there, between God's right anger at sin and his compassionate love for his people. And this tension is resolved in Matthew's Gospel. If you've got a Bible, uh, do please flick on to Matthew chapter 2. If you're using the service sheet, you'll see it's printed at the bottom of page 10. Let's just read how this tension is resolved. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt I called my son. Of course, in Hosea, that's a statement about Israel, God's people. A people who reject him, who go away from home, chasing after other gods. In Matthew, that is a statement about Jesus, God's son. 
And Matthew is saying, what Israel should have been, Jesus is. The, the son that Israel should have been to their loving Heavenly Father, Jesus is. And Jesus' life begins in the same kind of way that Israel's life began. They are both brought out of Egypt. Do you remember what happened next? Well, Israel are brought out of Egypt and they go through the desert, through the wilderness. And as they're there, they are tried and tested. They're tempted to doubt God's goodness. They're tempted not to trust in the God who has saved them. And they blow it. They worship other gods. They grumble. They complain. They reject what God says. And Jesus, having gone into Egypt and come back again, brought out of Egypt, finds himself in the desert. Have a look at Matthew chapter 4 when you get a moment. And in the desert, you've guessed it, he's tempted. He doesn't give in to temptation, though. He doesn't worship other gods. He doesn't doubt his father's goodness. And as we read through Matthew's gospel, we find that Jesus is unlike the son described in Hosea. He never forgot his father. Jesus always honored him. Je Jesus never turned away. Here then is the son who never made his father angry. And so we're left surprised that at the end, Jesus, the perfect son, experiences God's judgment for sin on the cross. Jesus is exiled from his father's love on the cross. Jesus, the son that Israel should have been, well, he's treated like Israel deserved. Why? Well, because he's the substitute. We know what substitutes do, don't we? They come trotting onto the pitch in the place of another. And Jesus is the substitute. He is the better son, the one who takes away the punishment that all of God's wayward children deserve. And so the tension in Hosea is resolved in Matthew by the Lord Jesus. How can a loving God punish sin and yet welcome runaways back home? Jesus joins us in our exile. He takes the blame, he takes the punishment, he takes the shame so that we might be settled at home with our Father. On the cross, love and justice meet. Christmas is such good news for those who are far from home. Because Jesus comes to us. He becomes one of us to live the life of obedience to his Father that we should have lived. To bear the cost of the lives that we have lived that we might bear, that we might enjoy the security and comfort and love of our Heavenly Father, that we might be home with Him. If you're someone who has asked Jesus to be your substitute, if you're a Christian, then isn't God our Father amazing? Isn't Christmas good news? Don't you want to worship Him? If you haven't done that, if you're not yet a Christian, why don't you come home? We've seen God loves us despite our sin. We've seen that he's waiting to forgive us. That in Jesus he has made a way for us to be forgiven and to welcome us home. What is stopping you from turning to him today? In fact, if you'd like to come home this Christmas, if you'd like to become a Christian, then I'm going to pray a prayer which I'd encourage you to listen to. 
And if you agree with what I pray, say amen at the end. Let me pray. Loving Father God, I'm so sorry that I've run away from you. Please forgive me. Thank you that in your love you sent Jesus to live the life I should have lived. To die the death that I deserve. I want Jesus to be my substitute. I want to live with him as my Lord today and forever. Amen. Well, if that's the first time that you've prayed a prayer like that, then congratulations, you've become a Christian. It's very exciting. Please do be in touch. You'll see uh, an email at the, uh, in the links underneath this video. Please use that to be in touch with either me or David. We would love to share in your joy. I'm going to hand back to David now. Let's pray. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. Father, thank you that you are different from us. Thank you that you are so great and holy. And as we come to you now, thank you that we know that you are good and powerful and that you can help us as we come to you now. We pray that as we've seen what you are like this Sunday through these passages, we pray that we would come trembling to you knowing that you are the true and living God. Please help us by your Spirit in these times, especially when we're tempted to grow complacent in our relationship with you. We ask you, God, to teach us to follow you. And so we pray for our hearts this Christmas, Father. With so much on the news and so much uncertainty, please help us not to fear or be afraid. Please help us to learn from this year about how fragile we are and how we need you to save us from death. Help us to look to you as the only one who is above nature all the time. And we pray that as the vaccine rolls out, that it would make us thankful that you give skills and technology to researchers and manufacturers to help people. And so we pray going into this new year that we would put our hope not in 2021, but in your plan to bring all things under Christ. So please help us, Father, to be the good soil that bears fruit 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold Help us not to get into bad spiritual habits while we're separate from each other as your people and while we're only gathering virtually online. Father, help us to fight selfishness and instead help us to practice serving people. Please help us, God, to be disciplined followers of Jesus who listen and obey your voice. Amen. We pray for our town. Father, thank you for our local community in Helsham. We pray that you will have your hand on people and businesses who are struggling financially at the moment. Please comfort those who are weak and vulnerable at this time. We pray especially for those who are working in hospitals and schools and care homes, social services and local government and emergency services, and transport workers, and the people who work to put the food on our plates. Father, please be with them as they go out to work each day, and please help them in the long days and the long night shifts when there's much to do. And Father, above everything, we pray that at this time, those in our town would know you personally as their saviour this Christmas. Amen.
We pray for our Christmas events and videos. Father, thank you for all the things that have been going on at this Christmas time. Thank you for the Advent videos and the carol singing and the Advent calendar. And we pray for ourselves as we do these things and watch these things and read the Advent book. And we pray for families as they use these resources. Please help us all as a church family to see the wonder of how God became man in Jesus. Father, we pray for all the services coming up this Christmas, for the Christingle services and the carol services. Father, we thank you that we have been able to put them on and make them fit with the regulations so that we can come together in person. We pray, Father, that it would stay that way. Please keep us safe. Pray for people to keep on booking and that they would come along. Father, we pray especially for those who've been involved in putting the services together. Father, thank you for them and be with them as they work for you. We pray for conversations this week as we invite people along. Please help us to be bold in that, Lord. And please would you work by your spirit, through your word, to reveal Jesus as Lord to blind eyes to people. Please would this be the start of walking with you for many in our town. Amen. And finally, Father, we pray for those that we know who's in particular need at, their mo at this moment. Father, you know what is happening in their lives. Please would you take care of them. And we take a moment just to lift up any individuals that we know uh, who is in particular need at this time. We take a moment to do that now. And so, Father, we pray all these things in confidence that you hear and you answer our prayers because we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. David, thank you. As we prepare now to come to the Lord's table for those who are going to be with us live for a time of reflection for us together online, we're going to listen to a new song and with it, uh, an extraordinary uh, video from Sovereign Grace Music. And the song is called, O Come All You Unfaithful. You'll see on the video people watching, listening to that song for the first time and doing so in the light of their different experiences. A stillborn child, a strained marriage, feelings of shame, legalism, loss, loneliness, or simply having a heart that weeps for those who weep. As the Sovereign Grace writers say, we think seeing their responses as Lisa Crow sings communicates even more clearly that Jesus wasn't born for people who have it all together. He was born for those who have nothing. Come to me, says Jesus, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Matthew tells us, she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So do pause, uh, do click on the link and listen and watch to this extraordinary song. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Now for our online service at this point, I'm going to invite you simply to pause to stop, to reflect, maybe close your eyes, maybe watch the screen where you'll be listening to the carol 
a candlelit carol, infant holy, infant lowly. And during that time, as you listen to that carol, do remember, as we will remember here, that Jesus comes born in the stable. But he journeys from that stable to the cross, and from the cross to the grave. And he does so for you and for me. He was born for you. He died for you. He was buried for you. And on that third day, he rose again for you. So listen in to the quiet words of Infant Holy. service draws to a close, we join together to pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Do pause, do uh, click onto the link for our final carol. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth Receive her King. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been great uh, to have your uh, virtual company online. Thank you for, for joining us for this service. Don't forget our not next uh, online service via our website live stream this evening at 6 o'clock. But let me finish with a final prayer. Uh, a prayer that speaks of Jesus the Son rising to scatter the darkness. May Christ, the Son of righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes again in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Oh, and of course, as I forgot to say earlier, don't forget to join us, if you'd like to, for Zoom uh, coffee at 12.30. Uh, and that will be the last uh, Zoom coffee encounter until uh, Sunday the 3rd of January. Thank you.